Darwin was born in February 1809, on the same day as Abraham Lincoln, and the same year that Lamarck would describe in full his first scientific theory of uh, evolution. His father sent him to Edinburgh in 1825 to study medicine, to follow his footsteps. But Darwin didn't like the lectures, he found them really boring, and he rather enjoyed being out in the Scottish countryside and shoot birds and observe the wildlife. In his second year, he met a very important mentor for him, Robert Grant, and he joined the Plinian Society, which was a radical society, and Robert Grant encouraged him to switch to the study of natural history. Robert Grant was a follower of Lamarck, and so this had a very lasting impact on Darwin's thinking. His father obviously was not pleased with him not finishing his medical degree, and so they discussed possible options for Darwin, and the best, best option that they came up with was for him to become an Anglican priest. So he was sent to Cambridge to study theology. In Cambridge, he met a very important professor and mentor for him, which was John Henslow. He believed that through the observation of nature, we can start to understand the divine law that regulates life. During that time, he also read the Natural Theology by William Paley, which argued that evolution might be possible, but the rules that set the course for nature are a divine law. And God really created all these processes that would potentially lead to extinctions, but also to new species emerge. In Cambridge, he also started reading about many other ideas and, and uh, philosophical um, observations. One very important book that appeared around that time was John Herschel's Preliminary Discourse on the Study of Natural Philosophy. He set up a principled argument that through inductive reasoning and the systematic observation of nature, it would be possible to understand natural laws. Darwin was also really inspired by the famous book that Humboldt had just published on his American travels, where he, where he described his voyages around the Americas and his systematic study of nature using state-of-the-art instruments. And it was really important, Humboldt stressed, that you have to observe every little detail in nature and you have to measure it. This is something that inspired Darwin to go out and follow the same footsteps. He also read um, Charles Lyell's book on geology. And in this book, Lyell laid out that Earth was gradually changing. So he set up the argument that nature is slowly changing. Importantly though, he did not apply the same rules and laws to living creatures, to animals, plants and humans. But he set up the argument that there could be change and it could be studied. He also uh, calculated that the Earth was older than 6,000 years. So there was a big argument back at that time about the age of, of planet Earth. And by making these calculations, he showed it would be possible that there's gradual change that leads to a transformation of nature. So important arguments for Darwin. And with all these excitements, so Humboldt's journeys, these um, ideas about a natural philosophy, he was keen to make his mark. He received a letter from Henslow. Henslow had been offered the, the position of a natural scientist on board of the Beagle. But after a discussion with his wife, um, he decided he can't take up this position. So he suggested Darwin. Darwin was young and he was of the right pedigree. He was a well-learned individual, a gentleman, so exactly the type of person that the Captain Robert Fitzroy was after. He was worried about his mental health and well-being and he thought it would be important for him to have a learned gentleman on board with whom he could have intelligent conversations. And he was also uh, aware of the possibilities that would come with uh, this two-year trip around the world. So he wanted to have a natural scientist on board that could make important observations and hopefully write a book about the, the trip. 
obviously, again, his dad was not very pleased with it. He was worried that, you know, being exposed to or hanging around sailors would spoil his son and his uh, upper class upbringing. But then an uncle intervened and in the end everything worked out. Darwin had to pay his fee, it was not a free trip, so he had to pay um, his voyage, which turned to be a five-year trip. But it was all good. In 1832, they embarked and went off. First they stopped in Cape Verde, and then their first major stop was in Brazil. And he arrived in, in Rio on April 4th, and then he uh, traveled up north along the countryside and for example here I'm um, standing at the shore of the Araruama lagoon the largest hypersaline lagoon in the world and he started observing all the the amazing adaptations in animals to very you know harsh environments you can imagine a lagoon with you know like a very high salt content yet he found creatures in there and that surprised him and it started um, him thinking. Then they continued down south, he spent a lot of time in Argentina, he found a lot of fossils there which started to think, make him think about where does life come from and you know like how come that these strange huge animals once roamed earth but disappeared, what was um, responsible for that. Then they traveled up north towards uh, Chile and went over to the Galapagos Islands. He spent five weeks there. He was very interested in shooting hummingbirds. He was very intrigued because he noticed that there are different hummingbirds on different islands. But he ignored the advice from locals that these different tortoises that were around the islands would differ from island to island. So that was an important clue that he, that he did not actually catch up on immediately. He also sh shot a couple of birds and he thought he had maybe three or four finches that seemed to be slightly different um, on different islands, but he forgot to label accurately and, and carefully where he shot them. So it was only after they left the Galapagos Islands on their way to New Zealand and on to Australia that he noticed something was on, going on with these finches. They seemed to be different than um, what he had observed previously. After Australia, uh, they went to South Africa. There he met up with um, Hersch Herschel. And it was a really great honor for him to actually meet this person that had inspired his trip initially. A storm blew them back to Brazil. He was not very happy to come back to Brazil. Um, he was very upset with the slavery, the conditions of, of slaves here in Brazil. Uh, because he had vowed that he would never set foot again in a country that's so mistreated uh, other humans. But initially, or eventually, they made it back to England. So on October 2nd, 1836, he set, back, he set foot back in England. And he immediately, because he had corresponded with his mentors, he had sent uh, letters back, his observations back, immediately he came back and he was a famous individual, you know, like a seasoned traveler. Um, and so he was ready to make his mark uh, about principally geology. He wanted to make contributions to the discussions that were going on about the, you know, like the age of the earth, how long earth has been around. So that's what he started off with. His specimens, especially the, the birds, he donated to the Zoological Society and it was a young ornithologist who was working on Australian birds at that time who first noticed that there was something odd about these finches. Uh, John Gold was his name and over the years he, in, or in collaboration with Darwin, he would realize actually a lot of the birds that Darwin had shot and he thought it was all sorts of other different species were in fact finches. So the three or four finches that Darwin had thought he had uh, collected in the Galapagos Islands turned into 14 different species. Darwin had thought about this on the way back but he did not actually realize till he was back in England and talking to somebody who, know, who knew more about birds than he did what he had actually captured. So Darwin is back in England. 
he accepted a very lucrative offer to write up his journal as a book. He's very busy, he writes papers, he's working on this book and Darwin was very frail. He often was sick, so he had a breakdown. He went back to the place where he was born, the Mount, and, in, um, and there he met his future wife, Emma, a cousin. And during that time, he also started talking to bird breeders. He also would join uh, a couple of bird breeding um, collectives. And this is where it dawned on him that maybe the study of artificial selection, so basically the knowledge that breeders had about crossing different adults and getting desirable traits in, in the offspring, could be used to understand the origin of species. And it was not until a couple of years later, in 1838, that by coincidence he started rereading Malthus's treatment on, the, on populations. And all of a sudden, a number of these observations that he had made over the years started to fall into place because he had observed um, all these variation around the world. He had started to think about artificial selection and suddenly he had a mechanism that would pull everything together, which is the struggle for survival. And so, you know, like suddenly things started to fall into place. And so in 1842, he wrote a first sketch of his idea. He shared it with his friends, Lyle, and at that time he was already friends with uh, John Hooker. And in 1844, he, had, he wrote a 200 page abstract of his idea. So he had his full idea worked out in 1844 but he only published in 1859. Why wait? Why did he not tell the world about his famous discoveries? There are a couple of reasons. First of all, he was now married in 1839. He married uh, Emma Wedgwood and she was very religious and she worried that they would be separated in their afterlife if he would engage in these ideas. He was also worried about the repercussions for the family if he would talk about his quite radical ideas in a more conservative England. Another reason why he hesitated is because in 1844, exactly the same year that he had his first idea of a scientific, new scientific theory of evolution, Robert Chambers wrote a book called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. So Robert Chambers was a journalist and he was speculating about the origins of life, developing a very speculative theory of natural history. And Darwin was upset because it was very speculative. There was not a lot of science in it. Religious scholars were really upset. The church was upset because suddenly somebody wrote a very popular book. Uh, his book, Vestiges, would actually sell more copies during the time then later Darwin's book would, would sell. But this book challenged the dogma of the church. So religious scholars were upset about the implications of the book. So Darwin was very cautious and he wanted to propose an argument that would be supported by evidence, but at the same time also would not offend the church too much. Finally, he felt that he did not have the pedigree to talk about biology and species. This is something that John Hooker, in a, in a remark to him, sent in a letter where he talked about a French biologist who had only studied one species and made all these grand claims about all sorts of other species. And Hooker remarked that it would be preposterous for somebody make an argument about the origin of species without actually having studied a large number of them. And Darwin thought, hold on, I actually have to engage in, in further studies. So he embarked on a nine year journey to make his mark in biology. So he went back to some interest that he had since his times in Edinburgh. He started studying the pinnacle of all evolution, barnacles, the little cousins of crabs and lobsters. There was a very 
ongoing debate at that time of what barnacles actually are. What kind of species are they? They're so weird. They, they cling to little um, rocks and shells, but then at the same time, they seem to have some features that made them look like lobsters, even though they look very different. So he thought, great, here I have something that interests me and I can make a contribution. So he spent nine years and then he finally published his book and it was worthwhile because first of all, he now became a world-known expert in biology. He would receive the Royal Medal from the Royal Society. He would be, become a member, a fellow of the Linnean Society. So really it helped him to become an expert and an authority in biology. And now he was potentially ready to publish his book. But then suddenly, sometime in June 1858, a letter arrived from a nobody. And this letter would change completely how he would go about publishing his thoughts.